Madam President, Excellencies, I am privileged to be able to once again share with this August body Sri Lanka's experience in promoting and protecting the human rights of its people in accordance with universally accepted standards. Madam President, in the two years and nine months since the end of the armed conflict against terrorism and the onset of peace, Sri Lanka has made significant progress towards recovery and achieving reconciliation by incrementally overcoming many challenges posed to the nation and its people by almost 30 years of conflict. The rollback and eventual abolition of emergency regulations in August 2011, in tandem with the gradual improvement in the country's law and order situation in the post-conflict phase, has led to further consolidation of peace. It has also demonstrated to the world that Sri Lanka's genuine aspiration in its approach to achieving a peace that is stable and sustainable. Madam President, in my statement to the Council last September, I urged that the Lessons Learned and Reconciliation Commission, this is the domestic process, must be given the time and space to complete its mandate. We continued to brief the international community in Geneva of the interim rec recommendations made by the LLRC and the measures taken by the Interagency Advisory Committee on their implementation. As you know, the Commission has now delivered on its mandate and submitted its report, including a series of recommendations to the President of Sri Lanka. The report was submitted to Parliament on the 16th of December 2011, together with the Government's position on the recommendations contained in the report. Concurrently, the report was made public. In our view, the report contains a detailed and perspective analysis of past errors, including those that led to the failure of the peace process and several recommendations for the future. The report is comprehensive and contains detailed annexes, compiled following interviews with over 1,000 persons who gave evidence before this commission and over 5,000 written submissions received. The proceedings were largely open and persons testified freely and openly before the Commission in public hearings unless exceptional circumstances required in-camera proceedings. This is quite different to the Secretary General's advisory panel which held closed-door hearings with unnamed witnesses who were guaranteed 20 years of anonymity to secure their statements. This meant that the testimony could not be verified or tested for its probative value. The LLRC report, Madam President, on the other hand, places before us material of the basis on which the commissioners arrived at their conclusions, which are substantive and verifiable. The Commission has dealt with and made recommendations on a whole gamut of issues including aspects of accountability, something which several of our partners and interlocutors have failed to acknowledge. The resettlement of IDPs, the rehabilitation and reintegration of ex-combatants of the LTT, the terrorist organization, the detention of suspects, bringing an end to the possession of unauthorized weapons, the deployment of security forces, land issues, issues with regard to restitution, implementation of the language policy, socio-economic and livelihood development, administrative issues, and on the need to arrive at a national consensus with regard to fulfilling the legitimate aspirations of all communities living in Sri Lanka. I am happy, Madam President, to observe that advances have been made with regard to many of the recommendations in the report. The government will continue to address these issues in a systematic and thorough manner. Some of the areas in which gains have been made include the resettlement of IDPs, demining, 
rehabilitation of ex-combatants, implementation of the language policy, the recruitment of Tamil-speaking police officers, the removal of the military from facilitation of civil administration in the north, making available land previously used for security purposes for resettlement and return, and carrying out a comprehensive census in the northern province. There are also other recommendations in the report which need to be comprehensively addressed and we are committed to doing so. You may have noted that the Commission offers detailed observations and recommendations on international humanitarian law issues relating to the final phases of the conflict. The report endorses the position that the protection of civilian life was a key factor in the formulation of policy for carrying out military operations and that the deliberate targeting of civilians formed no part of it. This was and remains the position of the government. I wish to inform this Council that an enumeration to ascertain the number of persons in the northern province and to scientifically identify the number of persons who lost their lives in the conflict is now complete and a detailed analysis will be know, made known in the near future. Due to the unlawful presence of the LTT, no proper census could be carried out, Madam President, since 1981, 30 years ago. Among the people not accounted for and classified as deceased, we count people killed as a result of the conflict, including those who have carried arms for the LTT, civilians killed by the LTT as they tried to flee from the hostage situation. This is documented. Persons caught in the crossfire and people who migrated out of the northern province, either to the south and who left by sea to India or other countries seeking asylum. We need the assistance of receiving countries to ascertain how many persons they have admitted. As a further step, the government has decided to put in place a structure to further analyze and verify the data gathered in order to arrive at definite conclusions as to civilian mortalities and casualties. One thing is certain, the story of tens of thousands of civilian deaths that supposedly occurred during the final phase of the humanitarian operation is very clearly proved to be a gross exaggeration and a deliberate misrepresentation of fact. Madam President, the material placed before this Commission points to several specific episodes which in their view warrant further investigation. The government is committed to a mechanism for gathering and assessing factual evidence relating to the episodes indicated, buttressed by a strong investigative arm. The findings thus arrived at will form the basis of a decision on whether criminal proceedings can be instituted. The material yielded by this investigation will be placed before the Attorney General for a decision in respect of instituting criminal proceedings where warranted. The Attorney General is currently seized off and is studying the recommendations in the report with regard to allegations of violations of international humanitarian law. Military courts of inquiry, in keeping with international practice, I might add, have commenced investigations into specific incidents identified by the Domestic Commission. The mandate of the court of inquiry is to investigate inter alia civilian casualties and the Channel 4 video footages, including whether any deliberate and intentional attacks were made by the Army on civilians with a view to causing them harm or damage on any hospitals or no-fire zones. If so, the persons responsible for any such activity and to make recommendations with regard to the measures that should be taken with regard to such persons. Madam President, in respect of the controversial Channel 4 footage, the Court of Inquiry has been specifically mandated to ascertain whether any member of the armed forces was involved in the events depicted, authentic or otherwise, and to recommend the measures to be taken. 
A similar code of inquiry has been convened by the Sri Lankan Navy to inquire into relevant, relevant allegations. As you can observe, Madam President, Sri Lanka has taken clear and definite steps towards implementation of the recommendations of the domestic process barely two months after the re re report was made public. Barely two months after the report was made public. We have evolved a mechanism to look into accountability issues raised in the LLRC report, both in the form of civil and military structures. This is coupled with a time-bound plan in the form of the National Human Rights Action Plan catering to a number of other recommendations to move Sri Lanka towards comprehensive reconciliation. Madam President, as we have done in the past, we will keep the Council informed of progress when we participate in the sessions in June, September and in the course of the UPR in October. We have already extended an invitation to the High Commissioner for Human Rights to visit Sri Lanka. I might add that there is already a senior advisor of the High Commissioner's Office working in Sri Lanka from as far back as 2005. The senior advisor was in place even during the conflict and is still there in the post-conflict phase. Madam President, in the light of this commitment by Sri Lanka, there is no justification or urgency whatsoever in floating a resolution calling for the implementation of the LLRC recommendations and engagement with the High Commissioner when this has already been effectively undertaken by the government. What we now need from the international community is objectivity in assessing Sri Lanka's efforts. More than anything, we need to ensure that the process is allowed to advance unimpeded. Madam President, what protection can we have against selectivity and double standards from those who have eyes but refuse to see, and those who have ears and refuse to hear, but continue to insist on their pound of flesh. We do not need unwarranted incursions that will compromise successful implementation. Such interference by way of redundant resolutions before this Council would only undermine the sentiments of this Council as expressed, Madam President, in the decisive adoption of the special session resolution on Sri Lanka in 2009. In keeping with the recommendations of the LLRC, the military has been withdrawn from aspects of civilian life and are now confined to security-related matters. In accordance with established practice of post-conflict de decommissioning, the government has institutionalized the process with legislative oversight to continuously record specific details on the number of weapons recovered in order to bring about an end to the possession of unauthorized weapons. This will have important implications for human security in general and positively impact on the law and order situation as well. Economic development, Madam President, continues to play a pivotal role in the reconciliation process and the return to normalcy. Massive infrastructure and development programs are underway in the former conflict-affected areas of the northern and eastern provinces. The peace we have won at such cost to the nation and its people will not be a genuine peace until and unless the legitimate aspirations of all communities are met in a substantive and satisfactory manner. The consensus formula to the national question thus evolved needs to be democratic, pragmatic and homegrown in order to be sustainable. As a central feature of the government's approach to evolving such a process, a parliamentary select committee is contemplated to achieve multi-party consensus in respect of constitutional changes to fulfill the legitimate aspirations of the Sri Lankan people, enabling them to work in unison with a sense of national identity for a better tomorrow. Parallel with this multi-party mechanism, the government has commenced bilateral discussions with Tamil political parties 
as well as Muslim representation. We are a multicultural, multi-ethnic, multilingual, multi-religious society. 